Right. Hey guys, welcome back to our channels. Welcome the wonderful Kaz and the wonderful Shannon from the Soul Center Healing Crew, my two ladies that I love to chat to, and this is our get together for the Halloween spooktacular. Ooh. <laughs> Are we all really looking fabulous? Thank you, Ian. You look fabulous you, Ian. too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my idea, I've, I've done the least effort. <laughs> We'll forgive you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, yeah, so we're going to talk all things Halloween today. So do you guys want to introduce yourselves and what you do, where you're from, if people don't aren't aware of you yet and your handles um, of where you're, where people can find you as well? Go, Shannon. Okay, I'm Shannon Gardner. Um, my website is wisehealer.love and um, I'm a hypnosis practitioner, SCHH and QHHT practitioner and just studying naturopathy. So you can find me on my website or my YouTube channel is Wise Healer Naturopathy and Hypnosis or Hypnosis and Naturopathy, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. I'm Kaz from Journeying Soul Therapy, Soul Center Healing Hypnosis Practitioner based in Cambridge. But all our work is it takes place online and you can find me on YouTube at Journeying Soul Therapy or my website is journeyingsoultherapy.com. Cool. Just like that. And I'm Ian. I'm a Reiki master based in the UK. You can find me on this channel, <laughs> which is where you'll be going on. But if you see... Kaz's channel or um, Shannon's channel, then my channel is called Ian Robinson Reiki Zen. Um, and you can go to my website to book any healing or anything like that uh, at reikizen.co.uk. I had to think there. Spooky goings on. Spooky goings on. So, yeah. Shall, shall I talk about a little bit about the history of Halloween just to, just to start us off so we can go? I think so. I'm not, I'm yep. not going to go too deep into it, but it, it just... it. I found it really interesting to learn about all the um, all the history of it all and, and, and the symbology be it behind a lot of the stuff as well that I was reading. But I have written a bit of stuff down. I've written down like kind of like little keynotes. So so we'll we'll talk about that. Um, and then we'll go, we're, we're, we're going to go into our own individual kind of little stories and, and where we live, little tales and legends and stuff of that of the areas. Australia must be, I don't know, it must be pretty cool as well because that's yeah what... Tas tasmania is mm -hmm. i didn't get any specific stories tonight about tasmania but tasmania is probably considered the most haunted place in australia because of all the convicts and the just really dark history <laughs> there with mm -hmm. um yeah. the aboriginals being wiped out there mm -hmm. completely and then the convict um labor and asylums and all kinds of stuff so there's tons of ghost talks oh we've got so much to talk there. about we have <laughs> yeah. indeed so if you're looking to, forward yeah. to this um, me too halloween is traditionally a celtic festival um and it was called sawin 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 there's very very many different um ways of saying the word it's actually spelled samhain but it's it's Sawin. It's Sawin. Sa -win. Um, I'm glad you know what that is. Um, <laughs> um, and the, the tradition was to light bonfires and to wear costumes to ward off ghosts and evil spirits. Um, and obviously the Celtics, the Druids, the Pagans, they're all very um, connected to nature, very connected to the land. Um, and it was the 18th century um, that where Pope Gregory III designated November the 1st as... All Saints Day and the evening before became known as All Hallows Eve, which is obviously what we know now as Halloween. Um, November the 1st then was also the, the new year. Um, so it's not the new year that we know now. Um, and that was All Saints Day. And this marked the end of, of the summertime of the harvest and also showed the beginnings of um, the cold, dark nights, which is all it was kind of attributed to a lot of death, a lot of loss. Um, and and that was kind of like that part of the year became known as that kind of like dark era of, of the year. And they also believed that this was where the veil between the living and the dead was at its thinnest. 
Um, so I found, I mean, I, I did know some of that, but I found that really, really interesting. And and as well, if, if you look into it, there's a lot of the symbology um, behind it is, um, is, is used across all traditions. It's used across all religions as well. You know, it's, it's deep within everything. Um, and the Celts also thought that the presence of other otherworldly spirits uh, made it easier for Druids or the Celtic deities and priests to make um, connections and pr predictions to that side. Um, and the Druids used to build large bonfires and burn crops and had animal sacrifices um, to the Celtic deities. And the Celts wore costumes of animal heads and skin to ward off evil presences. And then after I read that, I thought, well, where did the whole thing about pumpkins come into it? So I was just like, you know, it just seemed to be like something kind of like random. Um, but that's been that's been around for like hundreds of years, this pumpkin thing. Um, and it started in Ireland as where a lot of the, the Celts came from, like Ireland, Scotland, England, also like northern France, because it was to do with, to do with Gaul and that, and that sort of region in northern France. Um, and they carved turnips or potatoes back then. Um, I remember as a kid using turnips. I used to carve turnips, and we did too. And they were oh, really, that's me. really hard to carve. Yeah, <laughs> like, <laughs> like like bricks. That's cool. Yeah, um, I had no idea. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what that's what we used to use. So it was just like, and and like I look now and I just think that's people carving pumpkins is like nothing compared to what we used to do <laughs> using turnips. Um, yeah it was the irish settlers that used pumpkins when that when they moved over to america they discovered the pumpkin and used them because they were a softer fruit mm. <laughs> there we go uh, That's a little bit of history i've got a little bit more for later on about jack-o-lanterns and where that comes from but let's talk about let's talk about ghosts let's talk about spirits let's talk about this time of the year so what's it mean to you two guys yeah, well, I was just going to add to what you said, Ian, about Halloween, and I read a little bit about what you were saying as well, and apparently, originally, Halloween was in the spring, and it was um, Pope Gregory IV in 1837 who changed it to the fall, and it says in the Britannica Encyclopedia that, that he had changed it, but it doesn't say why. <laughs> doesn't say why he changed it and they're saying oh it's unknown but I'm pretty sure someone has out there has to know the reason why but it could be because of what you said with the the change of the season and the end of the summer and that sort of thing and then another little fun fact about the Christian holiday of Halloween of All Saints Day was that the word Halloween hallow is actually two words apparently put in to one so hallow means holy person um, referring to the saints the all saints for all saints day and then um, the in part of halloween was short for evening so hollow evening was the evening before all saints day um, similar to like christmas eve or whatever for christmas so, yeah. right. Right. So adding that in yeah that's interesting yeah i didn't find that yeah. my, bit of, my bit of research oh no i'm just adding it in oh, <laughs> a little fun fact good of where the word halloween because some people write it with the little apostrophe and then the yeah yeah between mm. the two e's so that must be why or whatever yeah well i was telling you guys before we started recording that I grew up in Scotland till I was 11. So yeah. before 11, cool. I used to do the old fashioned stuff. We didn't have trick or treats and all that kind of palaver. Do you remember, Ian? You're younger than me, but not by much. Palaver. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what we used to do is disguise ourselves. So you would go guising, um, usually as someone that had passed already. Um, I remember vividly as a kid being dressed up as Charlie Chaplin for one. Wow for one Halloween that's night neat. Yeah, um, that's neat. and you would just go to your neighbor's houses and you'd have to do a trick or a song um, mm. just for just to, because you were helping the the community like avoid any kind of dark spirits coming in mm. because you were in disguise the spirits wouldn't see you because the veil was so thin 
they would just kind of think you're one of them. And oh, we cool. used to do um, neap carving, like the lantern thing. Yeah. We used to duck for apples. Mm -hmm. So like apple dunking, which actually has its history in romance. So you would usually you put a name on the apple and whoever's name you bit into, that's who you were going to marry. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I don't know if anyone else did this. We used to do treacle scones. So you would dunk, dunk uh, scones in treacle or molasses and hang them from a string and you'd have to try and catch it in your mouth. <laughs> oh, really? That's cool. Well, um, I don't know what the history of that is. That's probably a romantic thing too. So there are some romantic aspects to our Scottish traditions that I grew up with. Yeah, yeah. Do you yeah. think that's where um, toffee apples came from? That sort of... Possibly. Yeah, oh, yeah that makes sense. Because mm. obviously the apple bobbing, toffee scones, are treats, mm. you know, at least they're getting one of the five a day through once they get through all the... <laughs> some fruits, yeah. So that's what we used to do, and obviously have a bonfire. We didn't go trick or treating, but we'd usually have a party of some kind. Yeah, yeah. Oh, nice. awesome. yeah. Awesome. So I don't know when the trick or treating thing came to the UK. Maybe it like twenty be, years. Or... It seems to be like really like a big thing now, didn't it? But I mean, mm. when I was a kid, I mean, like yeah, we we went round and and did the sort of like trick or treat or pay for Halloween or all that sort of stuff. But um, it was it wasn't massive even when when I was a kid. But now it's like it's really prevalent now. Um, but I think more so with people just decorating the houses and 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 maybe having Halloween parties mm. rather than actual going out and dressing up and what have you. I think that's like a really really fun fun part about it. And it and it's again it's very. Um, it's very community orientated, isn't it? And bringing families together, it's like a celebration for that time of the year. Even if a lot of people aren't aware of the actual origins of it, it's just the way it's kind of organically um, happened o over over the centuries. So, yeah. yeah. So it's funny that you brought up the the um, decorations and that because uh, Halloween's always been really huge in Canada and in North America since I was a kid. Um, but I can't, obviously I lived in, I've been living in Australia for, since two, 2008 and, you know, where we lived for years, nobody, not a single person has ever knocked on our door in six years at the, at the last house that we lived at. Um, but it's, it's gained so much popularity here in the last few years and last year. So my kids and I have never really my kids have never celebrated Halloween. They went to a private school for a little bit before we homeschooled and which was a Christian school. And that was like just a massive no-no at their school. And people were just, you know, a lot of people, my husband didn't grow up with Halloween or anything here in Australia. It wasn't really a thing at all. And most of the time I've lived here hasn't been very big I'm sure some people celebrate with Halloween parties and that but as far as the trick-or-treating it's never been that big um, last year we were in Canada I took my kids there and oh my gosh it's like Christmas you know when you see on the movies about like neighbors outdoing each other with the Christmas lights mm -hmm. <laughs> it was like that like <laughs> there was like these massive uh, people were just outdoing each other and you had that dad thing going on that you see in movies about dads outdoing other dads at the Christmas lights it was like that with the um, I couldn't believe how how much more decorations there were from when I was a kid because it was huge when I was a kid in North America and then now this year in Australia coming back so today was our first time we've ever had anyone knock on our door and I ran out of candy there was that many kids um, oh. that came there wasn't definitely wasn't the decorations like you see in North America there was a few here and there um, you know but like it's massive in North America it always has been since I was a kid over there yeah and then we also have devil's night as well do you guys have that where are you guys no. what's that they don't have it here in Australia either. So the night before Halloween is called Devil's Night in North America. 
And it started around the 1940s as a night of mischief. So people would go out and it's a night of pranks where you like you egg someone's house or you toilet paper someone's house or you you play pranks on people right you or you you might put something else on someone's lawn or something funny or whatever it's meant it was I think in the beginning it was meant to be just like a bit of fun and a bit of pranking yeah so I took part in that a little bit as a teenager. <laughs> oh, Shannon. <laughs> <laughs> I had friends who had like chicken farms and had like just eggs and eggs, but I would I didn't throw any. I was just in the car. <laughs> I was just going along for the ride. <laughs> but there was like a bunch of us in in a couple few different cars and I was just, you know, going along for the ride and our guy friends were driving and they decided to throw some eggs at a cop's house, a police officer's house. And Ooh. yeah, we just like <laughs> took <laughs> off <laughs> and it turned into a police chase. Obviously the, the police officer was off duty, but we were just, you know, driving down like dirt roads and into paddocks and stuff trying to, hide from this police officer I had no idea I was just going along for the ride sitting in the back seat anyone watching this right now we do not condone <laughs> any of this activity whatsoever no we do not no we don't police officer's house <laughs> so well, I want to know what's police. the tradition of the devil's night where did that come I from I don't know how exactly it got started I, I did look up Wikipedia and like try to find a few sources apparently it got so out of hand in the states that by the 90s it was so bad in detroit with vandalism arson and and like so bad it got totally out of hand that in by like 1994 in detroit um the council or the mayor had decided to make a new <laughs> name uh called like angels night or something and they had like 50,000 volunteers like going out patrolling the streets because it was just getting so out of hand. And my mom's birthday is on Devil's Day. <laughs> God, you wouldn't want to leave your house, would you? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, not every house gets it or anything like that. And nothing happened. I was in Canada, you know, this year for over Halloween and you know, I didn't see anyone's houses. So I think it's kind of died down a bit. It was still, you know, a bit of fun back when I was younger. But It's like that movie, The Purge, where you can go out and just do whatever you want for one night of the year. <laughs> yeah. That could easily get out of hand. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so they definitely don't have that here in Australia either. That's like a Canadian uh, American thing <laughs> for sure. Oh, yeah. Wow. Wow. So, what's your thoughts on kind of um, ghosts and spirits? What do you think is like the difference between a ghost and a spirit? Um, I don't know, really. Um, that's a tricky one. Have you guys got thoughts? Yeah. So, what's your thought, Ian? I'm thinking more like a, a ghost is kind of like a. Uh, it's like a non-intelligent it's like a replay it's like a replay of history it's like it's like reenactments and you know sometimes you see like people say about seeing things in where they had the bat battle of uh, was it Gettysburg in America and and the see sometimes they'll see re reenactments and re replays of that or even in people's houses you know you, you can you can hear things sometimes and it may just be like a replay and that's kind of like what I would deem as ghostly activity um, whereas a spirit is something I would connect to something that's like intelligent and is able to actually communicate with you. So it's got some sort of connection of um, consciousness that you can connect with rather than just a ghost. It's kind of like a replay. That's mm. my thought anyway. It's quite interesting. It's like they've proven, haven't they? Like walls have memories, don't they? Mm. Stone tape theory. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's guess it's something like that. Yeah. yeah, I do say like there's a lot of old 
um, old buildings, you know, like castles, um, big manor homes that are made of a certain material. I think it's like sandstone or something like that, where it's it it holds a lot of energy. So anything mm. that happens within those walls, it's kind of like stored and and held within the brickwork and and in the very foundations of the building. So it, there's a lot of that kind of either trapped spirit energy or um, trapped replay of, of that energy as well, the things that have happened over time. Um, I think, yeah, I think that energy can be caught in a lot of different objects. And some people believe that there is, is definitely an energy in everything. And even when we have keepsakes or yeah, yeah. Um, even furniture or anything like that, um, you could buy you know, a secondhand piece of furniture from someone and it could have really bad energy if it's come from somewhere. It's going to carry that energy from the previous place where it was. So I've heard that as well. That's like the um, the haunted collector, isn't it? The guy that collects antiques or he's over in America um, and he's, he's actually a demonologist and he works works with that energy of and, and anything of that nature. He tries to deal with it and send it back. Um, but he he collects a lot of haunted um, antiques. <laughs> Why? I don't know, but it must just be something he's, he's interested in. But he collects all this stuff and it's all got like a, an energy to it. And, it. and it's something that's in there that needs to be, you know, either kept away from the rest of the world or it needs to be contained. Um, wow. You know, so, so some of these things like like black mirrors as well, you know, black mirrors are an interesting thing that I've seen on um, paranormal TV shows where, where they'll bring they'll bring bring a black mirror in and the black mirror actually contains numerous entities that they will use wow. to connect with people people that are already passed over within that property and, and there'll be that kind of like bridge connection through the black mirror um, which I find quite interesting in, in well a... you know a tv or any screen is technically a black mirror yeah yeah it's all oh, yeah never thought of that mm. Yeah. Same with mirrors. Do you, do you think the same about mirrors as well? Mirrors hold like an energy and and a, um, it, it can be a portal from, from one place to another. And that's why they say within within the realms of um, Feng Shui and whatever, you shouldn't put mirrors in certain places around the room. Um, because if you say, if you put it opposite a window, then anything can come in through the window and can be reflected through the mirror um, or go out of the okay. window. And it creates like a this passing junction of, of energy between between two places between two points yeah mirrors are portals for sure yeah mm. um so because someone told me something recently um if we're talking about okay how do i say this <laughs> imagine that not everyone here is real in this reality if mm. you get an old vanity mirror um, because the older the better because they were lined with silver on the back mm. and if you hold it up like and look around you you'll there'll be people that aren't there yeah yeah, yeah. and I wow. thought of trying it and then I thought you know what I don't <laughs> want to mess around with mirrors and portals I haven't tried it I'm not going to do it hey, that, oh, yeah. that reminds me of something really really funny um which I'll talk I would have talked a little bit more about later but the place that I used to work at, and I've mentioned it in, in one of my videos on my channel, but it used to be a coffee shop. And the manageress, she she was on, on a video call to a boy to a boyfriend at the time. And she, she was just sat around the back of the, of the building out the way. And it was on some stairs that take you like up to the next floor. And um, and he she was just sat on the stairs and he'd said, oh, who's that behind you? And she said, oh, no, one, I'm on my own. And she sort of like panned the camera around to, sh to show him. And um, and he and he, he described the woman that was stood there behind her, but she couldn't actually see anything. So she shot out of there like like crazy because uh, yeah, this stuff can show up um, on yeah. on digital devices. Yeah, wow. well, maybe it works the opposite. Maybe there's people you can't see, and then other things you can see. I mean, that place yeah, was maybe. so <laughs> so reactive. It was so active. It was crazy that place. I like, watched that video. It was really good. Yeah. <laughs> It was was a bit mental. I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, so yeah, so um, what we talk about there, ghosts and spirits. Yeah, ghosts and spirits. That's that's my that's my thoughts anyway. So, but I think I think it's quite an interesting question because I think and maybe a lot of people think that they're just the same thing. I don't mm. know, but it's it's all an energy, isn't it? It's all like a replay. Um, mm. I kind of thought I, I I'm not sure the difference either whether they're the same thing either. I mean with 
with hypnosis as Kaz would know and for yourself you've had hypnosis sessions Ian yeah you know we um have earthbound spirits I guess is what we call them that come up and you know I think that these earthbound spirits can be ghosts as well because they're hanging around and some people believe ghosts are the ones that hang around and haven't crossed over mm. and that's what we see in our hypnosis sessions and we help them cross over so um I just thought they're this you know maybe the same thing but I don't know the difference either mm. yeah because we're we're like a portal as well aren't we like us individually are all energetic portals um, and that's why things attach to us and cling to us and we hold on to all this stuff and and when you guys, or when, whenever we're doing healing, we're tapping into a subconscious level that is aware of something that needs to be removed or released or healed. Um, and whatever the modality, it, it's it's going to fix that problem and, and release it. So it's it's a it's an interesting process um, that people can go down, especially through I think hypnosis, because it's almost it's a bit like the mirror thing, isn't it? It's a bit like looking into a mirror of yourself, but through different stages of your life or wherever you've been whatever you've been doing yeah exactly what about what you is. with what about with reiki like because you see you can see um yeah it, I, mean, it's reiki, more, so. I think it's more me that that sees a lot of stuff but well, people do see things as well on their sessions um and and experience things it all that kind of stuff is is something i deem that the that the higher self and the subconscious already knows what it is and how it needs to deal with it and, and and let it heal on whatever level it needs to be healed on. Um, and, and then any information that I might give back, give back, it might, it might corroborate or it might back up that, or there might be some, some um, underlying message within what people are seeing um, that they need to heal within their life. Um, but I mean, I mean, I, sometimes I've tapped into all sorts of like crazy stuff and like, well, where's this come from? I have no like kind of, idea and they don't really know either what it is so, so maybe that's past life stuff that i'm seeing and, and relating to them it's just stuff that they need to be aware of because as soon as you give that person that information it's their subconscious and their higher self that recognizes it and starts processes and healing that area of, of that needs to be healed and releasing it mm. it's the same with the work we do shannon isn't it it's all done through the higher yeah. self mm. yeah. yes exactly yeah. Yeah. And the healing can go on for weeks, oh, weeks yeah. and weeks after. Yeah. I mean, the yeah. sessions I've had with you guys, you know, with you, Tony and, and Shannon, um, I, I know and I've experienced that the healing has just continued for like weeks and weeks and weeks after, which is why I've left it um, so long between sessions, just to give me a chance to kind of, you know, just process it, just process it and heal from it. Yeah, because mm. of the stuff that you go through energetically yeah. and physically. I think that's a good point too, because um, some people I notice who book, I think they expect to have like a quick fix mm. and it's, you don't necessarily, you can't necessarily um, fix everything in one session. I think, mm. he, you know, healing is an ongoing process, yeah. Yeah. like you said, and in any kind of healing, you can't just have a quick fix of any sort and expect to be fully healed in a few hours <laughs> you know absolutely so yeah. yeah but it's it's surprising how many people think that and i and you have to explain that yeah and layers of layers the session. onion isn't it it's layers of the exactly onion. yes the yeah. onion again i <laughs> love that analogy <laughs> So well, what, um, sorry, I was going to ask you guys if there's any kind of um, legends or spooky things in your area where you live. Same, I'm just going to ask oh. you there, Kaz. I'm just going to say <laughs> the same thing. But um, yeah, let's hear about Australia first. Let's hear yeah. about over there. Oh. Well, you know, I don't know a great deal because I mostly grew up in Canada. I've been here since 2008. But I there is with the you know, definitely when I went to town, uh, Townsville, when I, I used to live in Townsville as well, to Tasmania, um, just the energies there when I went. So when I did the, my reading with Akashic back, something, it came up in my session that I could like read frequencies and had this gift of being able to read frequencies and stuff. And I kind of figured I had that gift 
like that sort of gift but no one's ever seen that in a session like where they've um, told me to my face so that was kind of neat but but I went to Tasmania a couple times in 2021 and just the energy there was it's so crazy like not crazy but so intense um there's so many lost souls there who have not crossed over I could just feel them like everywhere I went and because of the dark past in Tasmania like I I feel like that place just really needs so much healing that it hasn't received and you know a lot of people don't know what happened in Tasmania but a lot of the convicts um, and not just convicts, but some of the family members and that that came over to Australia originally um, got dumped there, you know, in Port Arthur and other places of the big gold there in Port Arthur. And that place has ghost tours and there's ghost tours all over Tasmania. There's women that came over who were both convicts and also came over um, as free settlers as well because they were told that you know they would have a better life in Australia and that sort of thing so there was a lot of uh women uh buildings and places for women to live in in exchange for their labor and then later on um were sent to other houses to work as uh, maids and stuff like that so at the same time, there was um, the Aboriginal people there as well got completely wiped out um, on the whole island as well. And so it's just that a lot of Australia is built on this convict slavery and then also with the slavery and the eradication of like big groups of Aboriginal tribes as well. And I just don't think that it's been healed. Like, I think someone needs to come. We need like a team of people to come there and just free these souls, these souls that are trapped there still, because there are ghosts and spirits everywhere in that place. Um, yeah. And yeah, I haven't, I, I want to do the ghost tour in Port Arthur, but it got me also thinking because like Kaz you did a ghost tour too and it got me thinking about whether these ghosts I wonder if these ghosts or spirits like you know people going on these tours or not or what the go I wonder what they what they think about it you know what I mean if if I'm curious about that, you know, what they think. But anyway. I uh, mentioned that because I was, I was just about to say, do you guys ever watch sort of paranormal TV shows, any sort of spooky shows? Because um, the, the, there's a few where where they kind of like coax them and, and try to make them react. And I don't think that's a really a very respectful no. way of, of doing it, you know. And, and and there is a couple of shows that I watch where, where the, there's one, one is my favourite. It's called The Dead Files. And it's with a medium called... Um, Amy Allen and she, and she has um, a sidekick who and they never meet through the whole show and he's like a retired um, homicide detective so he he looks into all the history of the of the of the area and the buildings and the houses and stuff like that whereas she looks at the more of the spiritual stuff and sometimes she'll find out that the buildings that they're going in these people that are living there are actually sort of goading and coaxing and and calling these people names you know when they're actually just people you know um, or if there's been a lot of um, sort of heavy negative emotional activity actually creates an elemental force um, within that home, which can be this negative thing that creates its own sort of consciousness of, of devilment, basically a mischief and can be a bit of a trickster and want to just cause, cause these, these divisions with people and split. So, so she doesn't like people that do that. And she's, she's very much more respectful um, and, in, in the early days of the show, show, she actually said that she used to take all these trapped spirits home with her and then heal them and then pass them over, over into the light. But she said that she found that extremely unhealthy. It was a very unhealthy way of working because she'd have so much of this sort of old dead energy um, around her that um, that isn't good for us to be hanging on to. Um, so we need to let it go and we need to, need to release it, which is why 
people go and meet people like us. Um, so yeah, um, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I, I did used to watch quite a lot of paranormal TV shows years ago, and I, I don't really watch them as much now. What about you? What about you guys? Do you watch them? I'm watching something with my son at the minute. He got me into, oh, I forget what it's called, though, 28 Days oh something rather where these psychics and intuitives um need to go in and spend 28 days in a haunted location all right um but all they right. do the same thing they poke um the psychic mm. the sensitives um which are usually women for whatever reason they they don't it's the guys with them the investigators they poke at these spirits to create some sort of reaction mm. and I was the same as you and I just thought this is not good no I know mm. it's not what I do if I go into a pub in town or when I did the ghost tour I just visualized a portal of light um sort of above me or in the room and I make the intention that it's only open for 10 minutes and nothing can come through it. Only spirits that wish to leave can leave through this portal, and then it's going to be shut. Um, and if you also want to ask the angels to assist those spirits and make sure that it's shut afterwards, mm. I'd do things like that. Wow, that's, that's really great. Good. That's a really great idea. Yeah, That's really yeah. good. Um, but yeah. yeah, should I talk about my ghost tour? Yeah, go cool. Yes. <laughs> because there was one story that just stuck <laughs> in my head and I actually opened a portal for this poor, poor girl. I think she was meant to be about 17, 18 when she died. There's a really old pub in town called The Eagle and it used to be a stage coach, a coaching inn. You can tell because it's got the like big opening at the front. You'll know what I mean, Ian. Mm. And a lot of these old coaching inns are now pubs. Yeah, um, yeah. So there's this window out the back in the courtyard that's always open because there was a fire there in the 1700s and everyone got out apart from a young lady called Mary and they call her Scary Mary. Oh. Um, and she was she died in this room that the window has to be left open in. She was burnt to death. And if the window's ever shut um, by, like, say, a cleaner or a janitor or someone new on the team, she'll start little fires in the pub. <laughs> she doesn't like oh that goodness. window to be shut. Wow. Um, so I um, wow. opened a little portal for poor Scary Mary. <laughs> Go ahead. And uh, yeah, I'd love to know if there has been any more sort of attacks or fires in that pub. Yeah. yeah. I think a lot of pubs, especially in the UK, have some horrible, horrible histories to them. Yeah, I was just going to talk a little bit about that um, today as well, because especially with with old cities, you know, sort of like Cambridge, York, um, you know, Newcastle, um, all the old Scottish cities as well, that they have they have so much history of of conflict and you know, like like what you say about travellers and, and highwaymen and, and stuff like that that come, that went to the properties. And, and there's all this sort of um, heavy energy that, that is trapped in them. And it's, and it's a bit like what you were saying, Shannon, about Tasmania, you know, this heavy energy that can, it creates this sort of stagnant pool um, of where it just kind of like sits and, and remains. Um, exactly. So, yeah, and, and you can feel that as well. When when you go into some of these places, you really can. And, and for me, I mean, going back to when, when I worked in the coffee shop, I mean, I mean, that building used to be on um, on one of the ghost tours that they used to do in Darlington, like years and years and years ago. I mean, I don't even remember them, but when I started there the, at, at the coffee shop, they did say that they used to do ghost tours in this building because it was um, classed as like really, really haunted. And I was like, oh, right, okay, well, okay. <laughs> and then... Um, and and yes, yeah, so, so all the all the history of all this stuff, and and I looked into a lot of the history of the building, of what used to be there previously, just to try and get some sort of idea of of what had been there and and what it be, what it had been over the years, and it, so many different like incarnations, and um, but that heavy energy like in there, especially was especially prominent kind of like in the stockroom area at the back, because uh, if you went in there, especially if you're on your own. 
you used to get things like thrown at you, like um, bottles of water and things like that. Um, it never really happened to me, but it happened to all the other staff for some reason. Um, so, so they used to get things thrown at them. But then also when you went upstairs, so you've got them stairs I was talking about before. Um, you go up, you went upstairs, and that's where they used to keep all like the takeaway cups and dry packaging. But then they had like another room which looked like it looked like it was it had been started to be refurbished and then just like kind of like left. Um, but if you went in this other room and then there was a little door here, which was somebody's, it looked like just a front room because there's a big ornate fireplace in there. And then at the very back, it went down into sort of like, it looked quite officey, um, but it had these toilets and there was broken glass everywhere. And it was just so derelict. It was awful. Had a really, really negative feeling down there as well. And when we brought that medium in um, to have a walk around, she went up there. She was like, I don't like it in here. She said, there's somebody not very nice in here at all. So we did try to, she tried to clear him, move him on because he wasn't happy at all. Um, but she said, don't, don't mention his name for a few days after we've been, because it might just draw his energy back in, back mm. in the building. So. Yeah. yeah. That's so interesting. Mm. Our house that we lived in previously in Australia that we were in for a while was, had some things <laughs> going on there. <laughs> Quite a bit of stuff. I had a lady come and to clear our house because um, my husband and I could feel that there was some stuff going on there as well. We, when we first moved in, my son Caden was quite little. He was three, around three, and he kept talking about this little girl that was trying to play with him. That was always in the hallway um, near the front door and where one of the bathrooms was. And then at nighttime, after the kids would go to bed, we had this toy box um, and I'd just be sitting in the living room at night after they were all in bed in the toy box. Every night nearly sounded like there was a kid playing in the toy box, like the toys were moving around and wow. not right. Yeah, I was like, this, <laughs> you know? and then, um, yeah, a few years later I had, we had, a lady was actually a lady who I had had my first past life regression session with because she does other types of healing as well. Um, she did like a welcome to land ceremony with me when I had before I had my first past life regression session um, with her uh, because I was explaining how I need I always feel like I need to go back to Canada where I was born and grew up to re-energize myself with the energies there maybe because I was born there and I'm used to the land there and she said oh you haven't have you ever done a, a welcome to land ceremony and I said no so we she had asked for the from you know the ancestors on the mountains to accept me to the land and that's and that sort of thing so I had her come to our house and she was only supposed to be there for like an hour, but she was there for a while. And um, she all, saw all kinds of things. She saw fairies in our backyard, which was nice. That was really lovely. But there was this uh, man who she, or she said, she didn't say he was a man. She said he was not, she didn't say exactly what it was, but she said that he wasn't from this world and she was even afraid to even mention his name because it was mm -hmm. just like she didn't want to uh like summon it I guess yeah um, um but um actually has the same name as your teddy Ian oh. <laughs> Reiki <laughs> you teddy Ooh. What's his name? I don't want either of you to say it now, actually. I don't know if I can say it. H-E-R-B-E-R-T. -E oh. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that, but I just... <laughs> when you told me the name of your... That's my dad's <laughs> name. Oh, no, really? <laughs> yeah. He's everywhere, Shannon. You can't escape him. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you can't even talk anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, it is um not <laughs> this unworldly figure was like going up and down the there's only four of us um houses on this street kept 
roaming up and down through our front yards, like patrolling and keeping an eye on all of our yards for some reason. And then, yeah, she was just there. Um, my friend Kelly, she was there at our house for quite a while. And then she's like, oh, let me go under the house. I just feel like something. And then she went under the house and then immediately um, she was like, oh, that's why I've been here for so long because there was, had been this man apparently murdered um, like under our house. This is a really old house. Our house was a removal house, but this was a school ground. So the house beside us was the old school and then there was also we backed onto a park which was the old school house so there was two old school houses um so our house was like a removal house that got put there before we bought it oh okay and um so she said also mentioned about the little kid so yeah she think, had said that the this herbert had um murdered this person <laughs> under the house or whatever I know <laughs> so yeah that's what our house and then she had mentioned about a little girl there as well but she wasn't sure if the little girl had come with the house because the house was had been moved there from somewhere else mm. um, or if like it was a school kid or whatever but apparently she had found comfort in playing with my son Kate and um and was lonely and couldn't find her parents or whatever so and then we had a builder renovating our house and one day had come upstairs and was like oh there's a ghost downstairs or whatever so, <laughs> oh, he could see it yeah he was a person who could see ghosts um quite a bit growing up and then he had come upstairs and said oh there's ghosts down there at the bottom of the stairs so gonna stay up here for a little bit <laughs> it's so sad how they get trapped here isn't it because we see this kind of thing in our sessions all the time and they draw they die in a traumatic experience yeah and they I don't know what's like... going on and it's just so sad that we're not yeah. taught how to cross properly mm. you yeah. know and that's like what you were saying with the mediums and people who are doing it in um, one way and I've heard this sometimes with exorcism as well that see I find if you're doing it in a way where you're aggressive towards um, like even with demons as well as earthbound spirits that are attached to people I feel like in SCHH we do it in a really loving and compassionate way yeah and that's what I was saying about like sending teams like we need teams of people who are going to do it in a loving compassionate way like yeah um, we do in hypnosis because these were people as well who had lives and you know may have more lives and who may be just stuck here and, and need a little bit of help um to the light you know so mm -hmm. even the dark ones they've forgotten that they were exactly. light. they're just yeah. completely lost in the darkness yeah absolutely you know, my Reiki master used to um, used to be connected to a building called DAD, and it was disability in Darlington. So he used to be um, a carer. Um, I think this was like before he's, he started his Reiki journey, and and in there there was one night he was in there and he was he was doing like sort of a I think they were just finishing off some paperwork or whatever, but, but he was like kind of in the building in this one room with only a few other people, but the floor above they heard all these doors being slammed and shut and, and, and what have you. So in the end, one of his friends who was a medium, um, she came in the building to, to have a look around. And, and it was a, there was a little girl up there that was connected to the home and um, that used to be on, on the grounds of, of where this building is now. And this, it's still kind of partially there, the home that was there. It's still like the, the frontage is there, but the rest of it is now like this kind of big office building. Um, and she's she's very she was kind of like quite she was happy to be there, but she was quite unhappy the way her home had kind of like gone and just been replaced with this building. But but when the media was connecting to her, which although she could energetically feel the building that was there now, 
um, she was still seeing the building as it was when when she was a child as well. So there was that kind of like a little crossover. Um, and she asked if she wanted to move on. She said, no, she said, I'm quite happy being here. Um, so she she kind of like left her there and she was quite happy with that. But she did go downstairs and it went into a basement. And it always seems to be basements because I don't know if it's because you go close to the earth or you, you, you're deep in... And what we like, what we talked about before with stone tape theory, and you've got this connection of holding this energy within the ground. Um, uh, but she went down there. There was an earthbound spirit down there, um, and he had like a, a, a when when they put the foundations of the building down, they put this slab of concrete on his feet, and he didn't think he could move. He thought he was stuck. So he'd been stuck there under this slab of concrete for like hundreds of years. When this building had been the foundation had been put down and he couldn't get out and she was like look just pull your foot out she said you're not stuck you can move wherever you want to go and he just pulled his foot out and she's like he was just like wow and he just went straight into the light because because he did but he didn't know that he could just step away from that he thought that was it he was trapped because apparently he wasn't very wasn't very very smart really he wasn't really clued in and what have you so and again that's quite sad really to be stuck for that length of time um, not being yeah. able to do anything. But, but do you think time means the same thing there? I don't think it does. Well, well no, I don't it think... doesn't to them, but I don't no. know. It's, everything's kind of like now in energy, isn't it? But mm. yeah, it's, uh, but to us to think about it in contextual terms of if he's been there for like hundreds of years, you know, to us it's like, wow, it's a really, really long time. But to them, it'll just be like, just everything's just now, isn't it? Because we quite often speak to spirits or earthbound spirits stuck to people and they have no idea how long they've been there for. Yeah. They don't realise and then they're shocked. It's yeah. been 20 years, 30 years or... Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's very sad. It is. It is. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about some stuff that is near me. But so in this book that I brought, I brought... I've got this book, which is about theatre ghosts. So this is about theatres all over the country. Um, but there's a theatre in town in Darlington called the Hippodrome. It used to be called the Civic. And then years previously, it was called the Hippodrome as well. So they've renamed it its original name. And they do ghost walks in there. Um, so I am wanting to get on one eventually. Um, but there's meant to be quite a few um, spirits and, and ghosts in there. One of them is somebody, I can't rem remember the name of of the guy but he was a magician and and his act went horribly wrong and he died on stage um during the act so he he resides there plus i think there's a dog in there and there's a couple of other people in there so it, it's a really interesting book as well so if i don't know if you can still get hold of it because i've had this for a long long time but it's called theater ghost and it's by roy harley lewis so if anybody's interested in anything of that i don't know if you can see that okay um but even the masks are quite scary aren't they the the, the theater masks um that that's a really really good book and i mean I, I read that years and years and years ago um and the other book that i've got is called paranormal county durham which is obviously where i am and this is by um darren w ritson and that's got a lot of um really fascinating stories about the because because the county durham's well the whole of england's like really really old but um some of the stuff that that it talks about in here to do to do with Darlington and to do with places nearby um again really really interesting and really fascinating um that the main one um that I want to talk about again is kind of like an elemental thing to do with nature um and it's supposed to be like a um I don't know what the term is for but I suppose it's quite quite dark tricksterish sort of energy and it's it's attached to the river tees and there's a certain point on the river tees where people have walked and have been pulled into the river by this by this mm -hmm. energy or this entity and the, the, they've died um and i'm not sure if it's if it's still there i don't i'm i'll need to try and find out where i'm sure it's where because we have two rivers that, that run sort of through here through tees so obviously we've got the river tees and then coming off the river tees you've got the river skirn the River Skern runs straight through the middle of town. Um, and that was quite an industrial river. So there was a lot of pollution back in the day. And it's starting to get quite dirty again now. But it connects to the River Tees near Croft. And um, it's it's at that, I'm sure it's at that T junction where these two rivers connect. And I think it's there. 
where people are said to get pulled in. Um, but I mean, there's loads of stuff around here as as there is, is with with everywhere. Um, and I'm so I'm surprised Cafe Nero Coffee Shop isn't in isn't in there because it should be. I might have to write yeah. to him and just say you want you want to put that. You need, on. To, you need to edit that book. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so have you been Ian to that part of the Thames um, uh, where it says in the book? Have I've you gone been, for a little yonder there? I've I've been there before okay. where, where where the skirm meets the teas. I used to go fishing there years ago when I was a kid. Um and but it is quite it's quite a turbulent river. So whether it's because of whether it's just like a, one of these local legends where the river gets quite sort of choppy and just pulls people in or whether it's something yeah. to do with that or, you know, you just don't know because a lot of these legends, same as like the Halloween thing, you know, a lot of these legends and stories kind of like build up and build up and build up and be, become become a lot more than what they tr traditionally were in, in the roots, in the roots of it. Um, so a bit like Devil's Night, I suppose, you know, it starts off as being quite, quite tame and just fun <laughs> whereas at the end of it they haven't like yeah. pulled holes down because of it <laughs> yeah. yeah oh i heard of a good um legend story actually on my ghost tour there's a legend of the black shuck all around cambridgeshire i think the story started oh i don't know in the 1200s and the black shuck sure. the, the black shuck s-h-u-c-k what's that it's, a, it's an enormous dog oh black mm -hmm with red eyes um and it's been seen in cambridge city as well um it it doesn't mind women though it protects women traveling on their own it seems to be men oh, wow. that it, it doesn't like oh. so if you're wandering around cambridge by yourself and you're a man watch out for the black <laughs> shuck yeah but apparently arthur conan doyle um visited cambridge and heard about the black shuck and he wrote Hounds of the Baskerville right. story based on the Black Shuck. Right, because he was very much into spiritualism, wasn't he, in spirituality? Um, and a lot of those old Victorian, well, the Victorian era was very much into spirituality and, and wanting to connect the spirits and doing seances and, and all that sort of stuff. Mm. And, and when, when was the Ouija board created? Does anyone know how long? Oh, my gosh. That must I don't know when it was created, but... You know, do you know, Kaz? I have no idea. We need to look into that. No. But I do have a, a book here, Psychic World. Maybe it's in there. But I was reading about all the Nancys. Have you heard of all the Nancys? No. They're basically divination tools. So anything could be a Nancy. Um, like there's bone. <laughs> Let me, I'm not, I'm not, oh, hang on. <laughs> I need to reference some of these. Because I'd never heard of the Nancys. So there's Nis Nancy's and hang on. Where you just get anything and do use it for divination. Like kind of like pyromancy and, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, but there's so many of them. Right. Cause because looking into flames a really good way to 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 see and to connect to spirit and go into like kind of a I suppose a meditative state, isn't it? Because and then you start mm. seeing things form in in the in the flame as well. It's called scrailing or scrilling, is it? Well, that, that's okay. the scrying. I know scrying, scrying which something is something of. Uh, but you can use candles too. Yeah, candles are really good. Um, but yeah, because if I, I know from watching um, Most Haunted years ago. Uh, they used to oh, most haunted. Is that sure? Derek Akora. What was this um, guide called? That's Sam. <laughs> Sam. Sam. What are you saying, Sam? Sam. <laughs> if you go, if you go on YouTube, there's there's a video called Most Farted, and it's so funny. Oh, so every time they hear it, it's a fart noise putting it. <laughs> that was so funny, and he turned out to be a bit of a scammer, didn't he? he turned out to be a bit of a phony, apparently. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we've oh. gone off track. That was so, such a fun. Kaz, show. have you played the Ouija board before? No, no, no. Yeah, Everything you in my body a... just said it was bad. Mm. Yeah, mm. Ian, you just did a video recently on your YouTube about the Ouija board or whatever. Yeah, Ouija. I don't even know if I'm saying it right. We bought a cottage. Our family bought a cottage, like a cabin. 
at this beach when I was a kid and it came fully furnished with a Ouija board. Oh <laughs> and my so, I, like my parents let us play it. We didn't know when we were kids that it was wow. bad. Like we'd had no idea. And we had this bunk, we had this bunk house. Um, we call them bunkies in Canada. It's just like a little cabin outside. If you if your cottage or house doesn't have very many bedrooms, you just build a little cabin with a bunk bunk beds inside. And so we used to play Ouija board all the time when we were kids. Every summer when we stayed at our cottage, I had no idea it was bad. But that thing had like the corner broke off of the board. That thing was like, I remember being, our whole family was asleep and my cousin was um, over for a sleepover. She was older and my one sister was older and they were sleeping out in the bunkhouse playing Ouija board and we were all dead asleep in the cottage and they came running and screaming inside the cottage like just so scared and screaming because they they had said that the thing that they took their hands off and it was just moving on its own the little thing in the middle and so we had some a, a few spooky things with the Ouija board and like I would never play that thing now or let my kids touch one of those. You know, we got, we just had so much freedom as kids are, me and my siblings that. Don't, uh, you don't know what you're inviting in when you, when you open that up. You, you really don't. Yeah, come you in. don't even, exactly. And you don't even need an actual Ouija board to do it. Um, uh, I think my mom did it once when, in her younger days working as a waitress or something before she was a nurse and um they did it after work her and another um waitress and they they did it with a piece of paper and just a a cup or something and it spelled out the name of a person and then like the next day the the name of this person had drowned had died and drowned in Georgian Bay, not far from where they were. And yeah, I would, I would never play with one now. And like, now that I think of it, like, <laughs> what were we thinking? Yeah. We had no idea because we were just well, kids. I didn't know. Yeah. yeah. I've just Googled there. Um, uh, in 1890, the Ouija board was created for, spirit, oh. for supernatural communication. Who uh, by? 90 again is kind of like Victorian era. So obviously the Victorians were really mm. into that heavy spiritual, wanting to know a little bit more about all that sort of stuff. Um, so that's where a lot of that has come from. Um, I do know like um, a guy that I used to work with, um, he, he'd done the Ouija board with some friends and he used to live in Wales and they went up to this kind of old, well, derelict building. I think it used to be like an old hospital or something like that. And they did the Ouija board up there. And um, initially, at the start start off, it was all it's all started, and they used to do it every like it was either every night or every week on a certain night they did it um, over and over again. And he, I mean, he told me this story like years and years and years ago. Um, and um, initially, it was quite benign the information that was coming through, and then each time they went back, they were asking if it was the same person that they last connected with, and it was like yes, and this, that, and the other. And then. But then it started like making little mistakes um, and it was sort of tripping itself up because they were like kind of like someone was writing the answers down um, that was coming through um, and um, it started slipping up. So then they had to like re-ask these questions again just to see if it was the same answer or if it was if it was starting to get a little bit kind of like messed up with itself. And then um, and then it started like giving them names like, um, you know, like Nick. So after the name for like the devil and, you know, and then like Beelzebub and, and it was spelling all these different names out and what have you. And, and then and then at the, towards the end of it, I think it was the very last visitation they went to use use this Ouija board. They had, it asked for the, one of the friends, this girl, to actually just stand actually, actually on the board. And uh, anyway, they never they never did. They just left it and haven't, haven't touched it again after that. But it's like really really weird stuff you just don't know what you're dabbling with you don't know what's coming in you don't know and, and like like what you Honestly. were saying there because you know anything can be used as a form of like kind of divination and, con- and connection mm. yeah. i mean i use candlelight or i'll use crystals or i'll just use whatever I, whatever i feel 
um, internally with my own energy, what I'm picking up on. Um, but, you know, any, anything really you can really connect with. The other yeah, thing thinking, about, sorry, the other no, thing quickly go. about the Ouija board and the darkness is it cannot lie. Mm. The dark just it can't lie it will it will trip itself up eventually eventually yeah yeah Yeah. because that's part of the universal law as well you know the universal law is that you you cannot you cannot lie and you know if you if you want them to go then you have the power to to shift them to know to to move them on but again like what we're saying before it's about being respectful with it as well you know and just not just tell them to sling you up or whatever um yeah when we when you were talking about candles, we used to also as kids try to do little seances as well. And that's when, you know, same thing. We didn't know as kids. We were just doing it, you know. And I was at my friend's birthday party when I was like in grade seven, I think it was, and us girls were in her basement doing a seance. Um and then all of a sudden we saw this figure down the hallway. It was a finished basement. So there was bathroom and bedrooms down there. And this figure poked out of, poked its head out of the door of one of the bedrooms and all of the girls, I think there was about 11 of us, of us girls there ran upstairs screaming, except for me. Well, first I said, that looks like my grandpa, but he's not dead yet. Oh, and goodness. I said, that looks like my grandpa, but he's not dead yet. Um, and then all the girls went up, ran upstairs screaming. Um, this girl's name was Kate to Kate's mom, except for me and this other girl, Eva, who she didn't seem as scared as the other girls either. And that was that. We just finished the birthday party and my dad, um, the, ne- the birthday party was a sleepover. We were supposed to go to this indoor pool the next day. It was in the middle of winter. So we we're all excited to go swimming. Our family lived out in the country. And sometimes my parents picked me up early from things because they didn't want to make another trip into town, <laughs> you know, to come get me. So my dad picked me up at like really early in the morning. And I remember being really mad at him, like, why are you picking me up early? Like, I want to go swimming at the party and I'm going to miss out. And I thought it was because we lived out in the country. And he had, and then he said, your grandpa died last night. Uh-huh. And so I asked him what time my grandpa had died. And it was after my grandpa had died that I saw his spirit. And I told my dad about what had happened. And my visit to Canada last year, one of my brothers had said that um, it was after that story that I told my dad that he was more believable into, um, like, had more of an open mind to things Mm. after the story um, that he maybe didn't believe in that sort of thing before my story about that. So (laughs) that's my little ghost story. Well, I've yeah, I've want to add to that. I um, firstly, I just want to say, if you are doing divination or scrying, you can just set the intention to have only beings of light, you know, enter your space. And secondly, when my grand died, Shannon, I had her visit me. This was oh, three years ago, I think. Wow. I just I saw her shadow on the wall from my front room oh, wow. and we have cars we have cars go past on this street and the shadows from the cars or the street lights are cast on this wall behind me um nothing to the right and I saw the figure of an old lady move across the room and an hour later I found out she had died oh wow I think it's quite common yeah, yeah. Well, my granddad came to visit me after he died and I think I was maybe around about I think it was about nine nine year old so that was like 1989 i think it was that he died um and, and i think it was like the next day the next night when i was laid in bed and and um it was in in this room because this was like the back bedroom where me and my brother shared this room and and i was on the bed over there in that on against that wall and, and he kind of like just and i used to sleep facing the wall um and he just kind of like appeared through the wall um, which was like really really weird but it was almost it was like kind of 
grainy sort of black and white white noise so you know like interference you see on the tv it was like that and he sort of appeared like that and he just kind of like waved and then just sort of like moved away and, and just went it was like really like really quite quite lovely and then and then just the other day actually i haven't told anyone yet about this but just the other day i was sat um downstairs and i'm just meditating and i felt this really really cool cool not a cold but a cool breeze right next to me and, and my whole left side was tingling like crazy so i just i had my eyes closed and i was meditating and i just asked who is this and and i got the word stana i was like, so I was like okay so I, I just like started having this little internal dialogue with her and i was like can you can you show me um yourself now as you present and and she was presenting like a lot younger than than what i kind of like remember her as um but there was a, there's a photo that i have of her of her and my granddad where they both look like so happy and they're probably maybe in their 50s or 60s but they look so happy and whatever and i that's the picture i always see them as when i when when they show themselves together to me that's how i always see them and she came and she was she was so close she was there and and, I, and then she started like replaying all these memories from from my youth of things that had happened and whatever so she was like kind of giving me validation of things when she like funny things you know daft things and I started just like crying like crying and crying and became so emotional but I was crying with tears of joy just from this amazing experience it was so beautiful it was so lovely um just to connect to that so yeah it was so thank you Nana for doing that yeah. <laughs> it is so beautiful isn't it when they come to visit it's yeah. just I quite Beautiful, often get a pipe tobacco smell. My granddad used to always smoke oh. a pipe. Ah, uh, yeah. I don't know if you have experiences of smells, but I know it's him whenever I, it's very faint, but I know it's him whenever I smell it. And I always say, Dan, all right. He gets that, he yeah. gets the smell thing. Um, Because he, he, he gets, sometimes he'll get a visit from from one of his grandmas. And, and one of them always made, um, use a certain type of gravy. Um, so it was like a really strong gravy, like Compton's gravy, I think it was. Um, so, so that was the, that's the smell that he signifies with her. And then the other grandma always made Yorkshire puddings. So he always smells Yorkshire puddings when she's around. So it's like interesting. Um, Claire Alliance, <laughs> Good almost. smells. Yeah, Claire Alliance. That's that, that's that ability, yeah. Um, being able to smell things. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, what shall we end on? What shall we end the video on? Because we've been talking for like an hour and a quarter nearly. Oh, we have, haven't we? I'm not sure, really. I just wanted to mention some scary books that I quite liked when I was yeah. a kid. Yeah. And one of them, it was The Hound of the Baskervilles. So that totally ties into the Cambridge thing. Yeah. And Jane Eyre. Oh, uh, yeah. Have you read Jane Eyre? I think I did. I've school. heard of it. it and years oh, and years. Of it spooked me I've out. I've heard it's good. But I love that old style of writing anyway, and the way they build up the scene and then, oh, Jane has a fabulous book. But yeah, I I've found it super scary. I don't need horror or anything. I like a good thriller, you know, yeah. where you don't know what's going on till the end. Uh, yeah, a twist. Mm. A bit like um, the film The Sixth Sense with Bruce Willis. Do you remember the twist at the end of that? Yes. And then he finds out he's dead. He's just like, what? What the hell? Like, but the way it's been filmed all the way through, you think he's alive because the, the communication has just been there. Like, mm. crazy. Yeah. Oh, Ian, were you going to say something about, did you mention the jackal lantern? Oh, yeah, you did. Yeah, yeah. I've, I was just going to say, um, shall, I, shall I talk about the jackal lantern before? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'll quickly, but it's just a quick story. So, the jackal lantern, where it came about. So, uh, Jackal Anton comes from the name someone called, used to call him Stingy Jack. Um, and Jack invited the devil to take a drink with him, um, but didn't want to pay for the drink. So convinced the devil to turn himself into coins to buy the drinks. Jack then kept the money <laughs> and put the money in his pocket next to a silver cross um, so that the devil couldn't change back to his original form. Um, and then Jack freed the devil under the condition that he wouldn't bother him for one year. Um, the next year, Jack tricked the devil again <laughs> into climbing up, to, up into a tree to pick him some fruit. 
Um, and Jack carved again a cross into the tree to trap the devil into the tree um, and wanting him to promise never to bother Jack for 10 more years. Um, anyway, the devil upset by these tricks, the devil sent Jack on his way, I don't know how, with only a burning coal to light the way. Jack, uh, he found a, a, a carved turnip and put the, the burning coal into the turnip and use that as kind of like to, to, to light the way. Um, hence the term Jack of the Lantern or now Jack a Lantern. So there you go. I wonder what happened to Jack in the end. He still wanders the earth, apparently. Oh. Yes. Jack. I, I've missed that bit out. <laughs> He's been roaming the earth ever since. So. Mm. So we might be summoning Jack all over the world by making these. Maybe, maybe, maybe inviting his energy keeping in. his spirit alive yeah yeah or, or <laughs> warding him off or warding yes him. yeah true <laughs> but i found that the thing about the silver cross you know silver werewolves silver bullets silver. and the silver on the back of the mirror that i was saying silver earlier the, oh, yes. the cross sort of sim sim symbol simbler i can't even say the word anymore <laughs> symbolism that's this yeah, no, so interesting, isn't it? Mm. Thank you for that, Ian. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, I love I have, it. I have to say, I was going to dress up as a shield maiden, and I'm so glad I didn't now, because I was really going to go all out with the... <laughs> <laughs> and I think I would have felt really overdressed. I think next time we, we do this next year, whenever we need to be a bit braver and get properly. Yeah. I, I will get a proper costume for the next time we do this. Yeah. And my bell rings, though. If only I had my uh... costume still, I could have put Batman on fire to, to see it, to see that. But yeah. And then I put the whiskers on with some like black makeup, right? <laughs> no, no, and I. Okay. <laughs> But then I did this like hours ago and I couldn't blow my nose all day because <laughs> oh, I was no, like, you had oh, your little shoot, nose. I can't blow my nose. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, can, you can go and blow your nose now. You're, you're, you are free. <laughs> it's, well, luckily I don't have a runny nose today. But <laughs> I was like, how am I going to blow my nose now? But anyway. Oh, bless you. Kaz, well, I have you. to say before we go that your artwork looks amazing in the background that's, that's <laughs> absolutely you. gorgeous piece to your right beautiful that color. it's my little colorful corner it's my rotating gallery Stunning. it is and i love it i love, it. love the colors there is that a fairy that's next to you i don't know who she is is that a fairy yeah she's a fairy i'm saying she's a fairy now ian yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love that painting. I love all your paintings. Oh, thank really you. Wonderful. Well, me yeah. and Ian were going to do a sort of get together and talk about arty stuff at some point, weren't we? Yeah, That'd yeah. We still need to do that. We still haven't done that, have we? So we need to do that as well. And then me and Shannon are going to have a chat after here about um, about Reiki and the Reiki sessions. Um, yeah, I, okay. I think I decided to get... Um, some Reiki for me and because I thought it was a really good in between doing hypnosis on clients just mm. a really good way to um you know Fear replenish and my own and... energies in between clients yeah so that that's the main purpose from that in my session I had with Ian previously I I just like felt amazing after I had like my inner child came back and I woke my kids up they were dead asleep and made them have a dance with me and we were playing like <laughs> shadow puppets and <laughs> I was like just um the I had actually never hadn't felt that amount of joy for like a while because of probably because of everything happening in 2020 and 2021 mm. that I hadn't like stopped to like have it just was I, I had this really beautiful joy after the session and so I thought I need more of that Oh, beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. Wonderful. Yeah, well, enjoy well, that chat. Shall we? Shall we depart and and reconvene another time? And, and yeah, yeah, we shall end the recording here, and we shall see you on our respective channels again soon. Just look out, everyone tonight. Don't be doing anything <laughs> weird and dark. Yes, Just be uh, 
be safe. Stay. Don't be egging houses, <laughs> especially police officers' houses. <laughs> no. Yeah, so uh, love you guys. This was yeah, so much speak fun. Speak soon. That was fun. Bye. Love you guys. Bye.